welcome everyone to our uh, Tolosa webinar series. My name is John Mallon. I'm the CEO of the Tolosa Community Foundation. And on behalf of the team, I would like to uh, thank you for joining uh, today. We have a great program. Uh, very excited about our topic, uh, an inclusive city, uh, city for everyone, uh, which really recognize the importance of putting people at the center uh, to value and to, to serve the needs of people. So um, really want to give a voice uh, to people and a stake, sense of ownership, uh, so that when the city does better, all the residents do better. Um, and by bringing people together with different backgrounds and perspectives and experiences to share ideas, uh, to learn from each other and uh, to work together, we can really engender uh, trust. Uh, people can take pride in being part of something and we can build a community that will thrive. And when we talk about an inclusive city, we're talking about a city that's safe, clean and welcoming. It, it celebrates our differences as a strength and it shares a sense of hope and optimism for what's possible. And that's really at, at the core of the mission of Tolosa, which is to create a more equitable and sustainable future. And our vision is about applying that mission to a new city. And, uh, and starting with a clean slate, we have a unique opportunity to bring new ideas and a higher standard uh, on how we work, uh, we live and interact with each other and to create an environment where everyone can experience a higher quality of life and, and greater opportunities. So we're creating a blueprint based on the best practices of today. And we will share what we learn in, in this process with existing cities so that we can have an impact now. Um, our core, core set of values uh, to be open, fair and inclusive. Uh, we're everyone has a voice in the opportunity to reach their full potential. And this will inform our decisions and shape the, the city design. Your input and, and ideas matter. And uh, as a result, we've been very active with a series of surveys. I wanna thank those who completed our current City for Everyone survey and wanted to share a, a few quick takeaways. Uh, this is the start of the conversation on how we create a more inclusive city. Uh, based on your responses, the most sort of important and substantial issue uh, that, and barrier uh, is around disparity in housing. And many of the residents, over half, feel that their current communities are not welcoming to all people. So we need to do much more and there's an opportunity there. The community also felt that childcare, uh, health and wellness services and education were uh, the most uh, essential public services for Tolosa to focus on initially. And in the context of building a new city, our community felt that diversity and race, age, profession, and the level of education were particularly important. Uh, one question that was uh, asked was how active uh, the city should be in taking uh, uh, a stance in realizing uh, the, the goals and ensuring that barriers to inclusivity are worked through. And the responses to this question on the role of local government were, were very inconclusive, which really indicates the importance of this conversation and working with all of you, the, the full community and, and experts uh, to figure out some of these issues and uh, to, to work towards solutions. And that's really why we're engaging you, uh, the, the community and experts. And uh, we really uh, wanna encourage you to take time to join our Tolosa Community Network to be part of the conversation and to help us work together. And we do have a, a QR code there for, for those that, that haven't joined. Uh, so I encourage you to do that, to engage and to, to share your ideas uh, and as we work together. So I guess now for the program, an inclusive city uh, requires a holistic approach as it serves its people in many ways, in education, uh, in, in jobs and careers, in public safety, accessibility, and uh, much more. Uh, and diversity, equity, and inclusion are really a common thread across all of these sectors. Um, these are areas that uh, our experts today will be discussing. And uh, with that, it's a pleasure to introduce our moderator, and speaker, Netta Jenkins. Uh, Netta is 
an advisor to the Tolosa Community Foundation. She's a great friend, and she's the author of a new book, uh, The Inclusive Organization, Real Solutions, Impactful Change, and Meaningful Diversity. Uh, she's a DEI executive leader, CEO of Aero DEI, with an extensive experience working with companies to address gaps in the workplace. And with that, thanks, Netta, for taking time to join us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Welcome, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here. You know, I remember as a child how I felt or how it felt to grow up in a city that just didn't love me or my family back due to our skin tone and, and accent. I remember dreaming of a city that would advance all people. And guess what? That dream is actually now a reality. It's Tolosa. Tolosa aims to really set the bar high for how all people should be treated in America. And this is why we're starting with a blank slate. We are creating a city that needs to accommodate us night and day as we raise our children, look after our parents, care for our neighbors, walk around after sundown, and while we are soundly asleep. We'll head to the next slide. Now, as a DEI leader, and a lover of humans, yes, I do love humans, this project gives me hope for our society. Tolosa will lift up all individuals and create a strong community. We'll head to the next slide. So today, alongside the world's leading experts, we will present the 1.0 inclusion model for a city for everyone. Now, the inclusion model consists of six key pillars today. And of course, we will begin to advance that further. I will provide a quick overview of the first pillar of the inclusion model, and that's inclusive governance, as well as the second pillar of the inclusion model, and that's corporate and startup empowerment. Douglas Alleygood, technical partner from big architecture firm, works on the world's most innovative projects all over the world. Douglas has 40 years experience from concept design through construction administration. He's an appointed member of the National Organization of Minority Architects, known as NOMA. And Douglas will cover architectural design that factors safety, accessibility, and equitable design. And that is the third pillar of the inclusion model. Our next speaker is Dr. Charles Moses, Dean and Professor of Management at the University of the Pacific. He previously served as the Dean of the College of Management at the University of San Francisco, Austin Pay State University, and Clark Atlanta University. He's an adjunct pro professor of management at Bentley University and lectured at Duke University. Dr. Moses' research focuses on the social conditions informing entrepreneurship. He will cover education today, which will be the fourth pillar of our inclusion model. Our final speaker is Kenya Nunez, Director of the Entrepreneurship Assistance Center Program at Hofstra University. She offers resources, guidance, and mentorship to small businesses. She also creates an award-winning, created an award-winning self-care program called Savvy Gems. Kenya has customized trainings for teens, the special needs community, students in alternative learning centers, immigrants, and teachers. She will cover workforce development with a focus on job training and lifelong learning, which is the fifth pillar of our inclusion model. Please note, health and wellness will be covered in a future session, and that is the sixth pillar of the inclusion model. Now we're gonna dive into the next slide. I'm gonna focus on inclusive governance. What we love about inclusive governance is that it's informed by citizen engagement. Our goal is to establish real-time planning feedback channels in Tolosa. And so this approach removes a linear government-led process to one that is more interactive, collaborative, increasing transparency, accountability, action, and genuine discussions between residents and government officials. Now, this also enables all citizens and stakeholders to consist consistently assess and compare equitable and inequitable decisions, implementations and results to quickly correct the decision. We aim to develop a community of care. So we will implement a public engagement model described as outreach, dialogue, decide, 
and implement. It's a method for planning that acknowledges the best results occur when informed residents collaborate together and with public officials to establish a vision for their neighborhood's future. Now, there are some key points here. Telosa advisory experts will continue to gather data through survey, live webinar sessions, and focus groups to implement ongoing ideas. We're going to nurture a healthy, trusting, long-term relationship with government officials. We're going to grow a diverse city through partnerships, jobs that pay well, education and healthy living. One example of many, we will be connecting with indigenous leaders like Mel Willie, Director of Native Partnerships and Strategy at Neighbor Works America to ensure indigenous voices are incorporated in the development of Telosa. We're going to closely monitor output and impact in real time to build on momentum and connectivity between residents and government officials. And we will make sure all neighborhoods have access to community centers that provide education and technology. We're gonna head into the next slide. And this is a topic I love to talk about, startup and corporate empowerment. So two years ago, I launched a case study that assessed the inclusion impact of a tool now called AeroDie. My hypothesis was, that if organizations have an engaging fun tool that encourages all employees to measure their inclusive efforts, then all employees will have an equitable opportunity to advance and navigate peacefully within their workplace. Guess what? My hypothesis was correct. And my case study proved that organizations will see an organic increase in representation, increase in growth, greater retention, productivity, performance, and even profitability. As a result, Telosa will encourage all startups and corporate organizations to adopt this equitable tool and other tools for the advancement of all. This contributes to a more inclusive city. This creates opportunities to attract, retain, and in fact, develop. So without further ado, I am excited to introduce to you Please help me welcome Douglas Alligood, who will cover architectural design that factors safety, accessibility, and equitable design. Thank you, Netta. Uh, my name is Douglas Alligood. I'm partner at BIG, and I'll be discussing, as Netta mentioned, safety, accessibility, and equitable design. So we are creating cities for each other, and that's a key element of, of understanding you know, the city isn't just an environment that you uh, that's alien to you. You have to think of the public spaces and the streetscapes as 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 ours, where they're created for each other. And um, so, design is a key element in making sure, uh, helping us understand what makes us all feel safe. Um, so, one key element is active and walkable communities uh, are clearly um, safer communities. So Telosa, of course, is going to be a very large city, but it will be made up of uh, walkable districts. I just want to make sure everybody's uh, seeing the slides advance. Yes. Excellent. So Telosa is intended to uh, grow organically over several years, but the vision is that the district, each district will be made up of 15 minute walkable communities. Each district will then be comprised of four neighborhoods and each neighborhood will be comprised of four communities. And as you can see, the communities will be very walkable in, a few, in just a few minutes. So even though there'll be districts and they'll have focuses, so uh, you know, one will be an education district, one would be housing and um, you know, conferences, the districts won't be limited to a single use or program. It's the variety within each district that will help create a vibrant and uh, help create vibrant and walkable communities throughout Tolosa. Activation increases safety. Pedestrian friendly streets where pedestrians are prioritized over vehicular traffic will create inviting spaces where people will want to sit and linger. Activation will also create self-defined destination spaces and unprogrammed outdoor space. Pedestrian paths will be adjacent to shared spaces as opposed to long stretches of straight roads, uninterrupted straight roads and um, that are interrupted periodically by intersections and um, street crossings. Um, activation will also extend to multiple levels within the visual connectivity distance of the street. 
A variety of uses will increase the potential for activation throughout the day and into the evening. Appropriate street light levels and spill light from ground floor uses will also add to a safer environment. In terms of accessibility, Telosa will be designed to provide universal accessibility to people of all ages, abilities, people with mobility and communicate, communicative ability disabilities and uh, or other factors um, in all areas of the city. Key features of universal accessibility are um, sidewalks with curb cuts, ramps instead of stairs, uh, slopes instead of ramps where possible, tactile warnings at transitions and audible signals at intersections. So what we are working on is um, considering how to create as many uh, transitions uh, that are curbless as possible, provide the tactile warnings, 2% slopes instead of handicapped accessible ramps. Um, and the, another factor in, is, um, in accessibility is to reduce the speed of mobility. Um, what we're proposing is that mobility will be organized to focus on pedestrian comfort. Fast mobility will be along district corridors, medium speeds at neighborhood boundaries, and slow streets within a community. Pelos will be optimized. We'll optimize the accessibility in pedestrian and bicycle safety by creating pedestrian-friendly streetscapes that offer a variety of streetscape typologies, um, variety of speed of traffic flow, traffic-only streets, pedestrian priority streets, pedestrian and bicycle-only streets, with the intent of reducing accidents and, and improving the human experience for people of all ages. So um, on the faster streets, green buffers will be created, will be used to create a separation between pedestrian and vehicular lanes. And um, instead of, as I mentioned before, instead of having long streets focused uh, for the convenience of car traffic, um, landscape islands can break down the scale and provide a visual character. And other factors in terms of mobility are that just to keep in mind, Bicycle paths have room for five times as many car, uh, more traffic than car lanes, and sidewalks have room for 20 times more traffic than car lanes. So reducing the speed of mobility is critical to creating an accessible streetscape. Meandering paths are uh, provided to reduce the um, for, uh, reduce the micro micro mobility. Also, curbless streets are flexible shared spaces that can be easily adapted for a variety of uses. What you see on the slide here is um, showing a streetscape that's been activated as a farmer's market. So lastly, it brings us to equitable design. Um, we're designing Telosa to be uh, provide access to equal access to public amenities like parks or active outdoor spaces, passive recreation spaces. Also, we want to um, design a city so it, to avoid locating utilities and highways or high speed mobility in one district or surrounding one particular district. Um, Telosa will not be a gated community. It will be um, open and welcoming uh, at the entry points. Um, I'm sure we all have experienced this, that gated, uh, gates and fences can send mixed messages. What one, makes one person feel safer can make another person feel unwelcome and insecure. Telosa wants to be open and welcoming to all. So consideration must be given to how cities grow over time as cities expand they naturally move away from the original center. So Telosa is being planned for growth. Uh, allowance for future utility requirements and distribution are uh, critical to the growth and expansion of the city. Uh, decentralized district utilities will help foster that equitable expansion instead of placing all the, the burden of the utilities in one district, as uh, well as locating the district uh, utilities along uh, district lines, along the high-speed corridors, and putting as many of the utilities as possible uh, in the underground tunnel system that allows for future expansion because uh, we don't know what technology uh, comes in the future. And lastly, I would say that a key element of um, a design feature of equitable design is to maximize the access to open space. Uh, the proposed linear park layout maximizes frontage and access points to the park. So by comparison on the left-hand side, what you can see is um, we've put uh, New York City's beautiful Central Park uh, and compared it to a stretch of uh, Telosa's linear park. And by comparison, uh, Telosa's linear design will more than double the amount of accessible frontages to the park and the meandering layout of the park will minimize the average walking distance to the park. So in summary, uh, 
active walkable communities or safer communities. And uh, Telosa will be designed for universal accessibility to people of all of uh, all of all abilities. And Telosa will um, provide equal access to public amenities and parks and not uh, focus uh, all the utilities and highways into one particular district. So we believe that's um, going to promote a safe, accessible, healthy and active community. Thank you. Netta, I turn it back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Douglas. Uh, safety, accessibility and equitable design are so important. And I'm happy that we're factoring that. We're hearing and we're listening to all of you as well in our community and our Telosa community. So uh, keep the comments coming. Our next speaker today will be Dr. Charles Moses, who will be focused on education. Welcome, Dr. Moses. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here um, talking about uh, something uh, other uh, than stuff we hear on the news every day. Um, there's always time, there's always time. We should always be thinking about uh, what could be, what life could be. Uh, and we should always be stretching to try to grasp um, the ideals. Um, and so I'm here today to talk with you a little bit about educational vision for the 21st century. Now I'm not offering you a lot of prescriptions. I'm gonna give you some paradigms, um, some areas, uh, for consideration um, and some ideas undergirding uh, our understanding of those paradigms for education. Um, and so let's start out. Um, I think the 21st century education uh, is, should be opening, question, and critical. Um, this runs counter to a lot of discussion that we hear on the news today about people trying to control education, a top-down approach, simple matter of appointing some people to a school board and the whole discourse on the whole possibility of education uh, in a school system has changed because of, because of the predisposition of the people, the composition of the school board. Um, and it flies in the face of the whole purpose of education, I think in the 21st century, which should be opening, questioning, and critical. Um, education should also empower, irrespective of gender, race, class, or sexual orientation. Um, we live in a diverse world, um, and everyone should see themselves uh, as being a potential agent, uh, having agency in that diverse world. And the educational systems that we create have to speak to that. Should not be this, people should not be excluded. People should not be canceled. Um, uh, there should be a wide range of um, uh, viewpoints, histories, uh, and, and orientations acknowledged uh, in, 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 our, in, in the modern. Uh, educational system. Education also values facts and engages in the search for truth. That would seem fairly apparent to most of us, but if again, if you listen to some of the discourse, educational discourse uh, in today's world, uh, people are battling to try to control the truth and put their spin on the truth. Um, and I think that uh, there is a truth um, that we can all aspire to understand and grasp. Um, uh, regardless of how painful it be, how painful it may be, or whose whose ox may be gored today or tomorrow, um, I think uh, the quest for truth and understanding in this world is, I think, fundamental uh, reason why um, why we have educational systems. Okay. The next one is education values skillful skillful stewardship of shared resources. In other words, the environment. Um, the environment is the, the air that we breathe. Um, and, and uh, it is really the ultimate public good. Um, and I think that we all ought to have basic understanding of the environment, our impact on the environment, and be able to lead uh, uh, in the preservation and maintenance, maintenance of the environment. Very, very important. Wellness, wellness for everyone, not just for athletes. Um, in our educational system now, in many places, um, education is, is really for, I mean, uh, athletics is really for only a few. Um, we don't talk much about, we talk about the problems, health problems, but we don't talk about creating systems that really focus on the concept of wellness for everybody, um, that everyone should have access to high quality uh, education and training and opportunities to practice uh, uh, habits which will increase their wellness. Education, a key, another key value is cultural competency. The idea that in this world, 
you should be prepared and able to rub shoulders with people who are not like you. Now, I got my experience in a lot of that by riding the number seven train uh, from Jackson Heights, Queens into Manhattan for about 15 years. And um, that's a good way to learn uh, a lot about different types of people without even really having to talk to them. You just can observe them and see their culturally, um, the cultures that they come from. And it's very, very important. One of the, one of the aspects that I'm noticing about modern life um, is that many, many societies, particularly our largest cities in the United States, many of them are segregated. And it's hard to believe in 2023 that we have segregated cities, but they are. Um, from the point of view of housing, education, healthcare, um, criminal justice, uh, there is a deep and intractable segregation, um, which makes it difficult for us to understand each other and, most, much, and more importantly, difficult for us to work with each other. So cultural competency is, a, is an important skill. Okay. Education is also lifeline, lifetime, um, lifelong learning. That's another watchword for discussions about educational vision in the, in, in the 21st century. The idea being that by the time we package up, edu package up education and deliver it in classrooms and in schools and in school districts and universities, many, many times the education is already obsolete. Um, and so we're always chasing okay, the target of trying to be current for our students. Um, creating educational systems that are agile enough to be able to keep up with the latest developments and the latest knowledge um, is really, really critical. So education is a lifetime, um, not just confining education to you know, K to 12 or 12 to um, 16 or 12 to 18 or 20, but the idea that education is a lifetime uh, proposition. Also accessibility, we teach, we teach we have schools in which we teach students, but so much learning takes place out of the classroom that the classroom has almost become obsolete, at least in the way we conceive of it. Uh, creating, using technology and other uh, uh, innovations to create multiple channels for learning and education, critically important, flexible channels okay, are gonna be what's needed. And as a matter of philosophy, education is that there's some kind of it's a classical model and it's kind of a more of a modernist model of education. And so um, things like criticality versus banking. And the classical model was banking education. You sat in the classroom and some very smart person came in and basically tried to store, uh, pack knowledge into your head. Um, criticality is the opposite of that. Criticality says that there's a co-production of knowledge that goes on. That both the teacher and the taught and the student okay, engage in an exchange of information, okay, which benefits both. And that through that uh, exchange, okay, uh, the ultimate aim of education is to liberate the individual, to empower the individual, to um, um, positively impact their environment. And so in critical mode, the individual learns that they have a value, an inherent value as a human being. Um, their senses okay, and their intellect are engaged meaningfully, okay, irrespective of who they are and where they come from. Important value, okay? Related to that is the next bullet, modernist versus reductionist. The idea of reductionism is that there's one story, one explanation for everything that happens in the world. And of course, the powerful you know, have the opportunity to shape that, that view. The modernist view says that there are many, many interpretations, many, many viewpoints, many, many histories that can be studied and that they ought to be studied for us to become a fuller, to gain a fuller understanding of ourselves and our relationship to others. So the modernist view says that everyone has something to bring, everyone's experiences has value, and we need um, to continue to encourage um, both the teacher and the taught, okay, to interact meaningfully. Okay. Education is also concerned with the person, who they are, their identity, okay, yeah, very, very important. Okay. It's also concerned with institutions. It doesn't, it doesn't separate the person, objectify the person, it doesn't set them down and says, you are a number of, you know, student number 400, you are a person, okay, and you come from somewhere 
and you will pass through the institution and you will impact the institution just as it's impacting you. Trying to empower people to be leaders. Okay. Education is also concerned in the 21st century, in my view, is all con so con uh, concerned with teaching people how to be discerning, how to be thinkers. Think carefully about the world in which they're, they're oper they, they live and, and the world about them and themselves and their neighbors and their communities. And to be questioning and critical and to be empowered to ask questions and to shape and act on that environment, discernment. Okay? Morality, also important. Whose morality, of course, is the question, because I, I think you probably could, could, could gather from my previous uh, comments that there are many moralities out there. But the idea is that there's no dominant morality, that we, that we put our ideas out there in the world. We try to bring, add our views to the discourse. And by adding our views to the discourse, we, we create an environment where more people can be empowered, again, to live optimal, okay, and fully affirmed and fully evolved lives. Okay? It's collaborative versus authoritarian. Looking for win-wins, both on the individual, in the community, in the school, okay, and the city level, okay, and the national level. Collaborative, building solutions that benefit more than just one group. Okay, win-win. Okay. Experiential. Okay. Theory is always important, but so is practice. Trying to find a good balance between the theory and practice and giving young people and, and students as much opportunity as they can to actually practice what they learn in the world. Okay. There's a whole movement. It's been out, it's, and it's gaining, it's gaining, gaining steam out here. Um, trying to get students to go back to shop class to learn how to actually do stuff with their hands and, 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 and practice um, with their learning in class. Very, very important skill. And then comes the 800 pound gorilla governance. Who will govern the educational apparatus? You know, that's a big battle in most places. Uh, people are seeking to dominate it and to impose their views on other people. Um, I think that in, in, in a, an experiment, in an opportunity like in Telosis to really experiment with governance models that allow for all groups to be represented and to have a, a model for discourse and interaction and problem solving and policy making that includes the broadest cross section of people um, possible. Okay. Some of the models out there, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, really, really good design uh, models. One of them is liberatory design. It really looks at you know, the core aims and values of education. How do you engage and how do you get people involved, okay? And really shaping an educational experience which is liberating, okay? And inclusive, okay? There's things like the progression, Progressive Education Network and Progressive Schools Network here in the United States that basically are, is a basically a coalition group uh, of schools that are basically on that path. But I think what we're proposing to do in Telosa is something totally different from anything that's ever been done before in a modern city environment. And so I raise these as questions. I'm not trying to present you with answers. I'm just trying to present you with a set of options and thoughts and questions that we need to wrestle with if we're going to design an educational model in a very, 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 very special um, environment for the 21st century. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Moses. Uh, so insightful. And I see folks here saying, hey, they want to put their down payment down right now and move into Telosa. I do too. Uh, yeah. Our next speaker today is Kenya Nunez. Please help me welcome. Hi, Netta. Thank you. So I'll share a little bit about myself first and why I'm so passionate about workforce development. I was born to a single mom from the Dominican Republic who came here when she was 17, and she had me at 17. At the age of five, trauma came into our lives in the form of my stepfather. I was the, I was the first to do everything in my family, first to own a credit card, first to own a car, first to graduate college, and the first to own a home. My mom worked in a sweatshop, and her dream for me was to work in an office. I want you to work with papers, she said, making copies. And that was her career goal for me. The bar was set very low because her only goal for me was for me not to work in a sweatshop. And so I got that office job. I became a career secretary. I had no mentors, no access to mental health resources. I didn't feel worthy. I didn't even know that I had unresolved trauma. 
And at 25, I got married. I had my first child, a child on the spectrum, and then had two more kids by the time I was 33. Looking back, I had mental health issues because trauma travels with you wherever you go, because wherever you go, there you are. Then in 2012, while battling my own darkness, my husband was diagnosed with cancer. Within a few months, he had stage four. Sadly, he passed away in May of 2013 at 39 years old, when my children were only five, nine, and 12. In the process of my grief, I approached healing through a holistic lens, and I was able to rewire my brain. I became the strongest physically, mentally, and spiritually than I had ever been in my life. And so how does this connect with workforce development? In the story I just told you, there were four main characters that comprise of the very society that we see today. A single mother, my mom, who was an immigrant, uneducated, and had a dead-end job where she was grossly underpaid and underappreciated. A college graduate, myself, who checked off all the boxes and had dreams but didn't know how to achieve them because of limiting beliefs. A man, my husband, who had an undiagnosed, uh, he had undiagnosed Asperger's for most of his life. He didn't know he had Asperger's. Never graduated high school, but still managed to own three furniture businesses. But he had no access to support when the stock market crashed in 2008. And his, begin to, his business began to decline. And at that point, so did his health. And then there's my son, who's on the autism spectrum, just like my husband, 22 years old. When he graduated high school, an SAT score of almost 1,400, a recipient of the presidential scholarship at the private university he attended, and now a college grad with honors and unemployed, with no mentor, no sponsor, no guidance, post-graduation. So how do we change the narrative when it comes to workforce development? So as you can see, we have the foreign model here. The foreign model may not be the answer, but it's a start. It's a great, great start to changing the narrative behind workforce development. And it's so important to look at it in or from a holistic lens in order for sustainability and innovation. So helping individuals prepare either for new opportunities to pivot into a new career or prosper in their workplace. So we'll go through them, the four of them here. Mindset. Mindset is the foundation of it all because our past can negatively impact our present performance. Mentorship. Mentorship is super important. According to a 2020 Harvard Business Review article, poor mentorship can actually be worse than no mentorship at all. And motivation. Motivation is one of the key forces behind any human behavior. In life and work is no exception. And then there's money. Money is not just about what's in your paycheck, but money that is put back into your pocket because you don't have to spend it when you have invaluable resources that are provided at no cost. Next slide. So what are some of the workforce challenges that we face today? According to a CNBC report, about 50 million people quit their jobs in 2022. That's a big number. But most didn't quit the workforce entirely, but instead to take on a new job. According to a report there was 41% who resigned due to the lack of career development and advancement, and 26% resigned due to a lack of support for their health and well being. If you look at the chart, you will take note that I added a color code to each one. And what you are seeing is that each reason for quitting actually falls under the 4M model, whether they quit because they didn't feel supported with their mental health and mindset or because they lacked motivation, lack of mentors, or inadequate compensation or money. The 4M model takes into consideration all humans, regardless of age, gender, race, sexual orientation, disability, education, income, or socioeconomic status. Next slide, please. So let's take a little deeper look at mindset. So there is a silent mindset destroyer that I only discovered in my adult life that we are not addressing in workforce development, and that is ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. The economic cost totals hundreds of billions of dollars each year. A 10% reduction in ACEs could save $56 billion. So what is the solution? Employers providing access to care that meets the employees where they are. Trauma-informed care, culturally competent therapists, and free education for health and wellness. Then there's mentorship. What do we have? We have access to mentorship, but it's marginal mentorship. What we have 
is not enough. There's lack of access to impactful mentorship. So the solution is compatible mentorship, where the company or agency provides an assessment of the mentee and potential mentors to create a more compatible match. There should be incentive for mentors, recognizing and rewarding great mentors, and then mentors in residence. Just like ERGs, employee resource groups, MIRs would provide continual guidance and training for the employee or job seeker. And finally, access to sponsors, sponsors that are invested in their protege's success and in their career and actually help open doors. Next slide. So what is the goal? Employment. So we can look at this as a two-way street. We can align talents with purpose, but we can also train people for existing industry demands. So for those that are preparing for the workforce, we supply them with paid internships, accelerators, boot camps, summer youth programs, so that the youth are not just unemployed or just trying to figure out a job just to get paid. We actually train them in a purposeful industry where they can use their talents, develop their talents, or align them with opportunities in industries that are robust. For those that are in the workforce, what's the motivation for them? Allowing them to have flexible work schedules, hybrid or remote work, no cost training and certifications, company culture models, free mental health resources. And then the last M is money. And again, it's not just money in the paycheck, but money that the employee will get back in their pocket because they don't have to spend it, such as competitive compensation and benefits, complete healthcare coverage, transparency on raises and promotion, equal work, equal pay, financial literacy education, tuition reimbursement, retirement plan, paid sick days, paid volunteer days, and it was mentioned earlier, childcare is a big thing also. Next slide. So combining forces for a strong, well-trained workforce in any economy is key. And one of the things to look at is the national grid model, which is pretty amazing. It's called Grid for Good. The program starts as early as three years old. From three to 15, young people can learn about sustainable futures. From 16 to 25, there are programs for upskilling and training. And for those that are 25 plus, they have access to boot camps and apprenticeships. We should also align with educational institutions where we'll allow for recruiting and retaining employees that require higher education for their career advancement. So for example, Recent graduates will, have, will allow employers to have access to that new talent. For students who are enrolled, they will have access to internship opportunities. And for those that are active employees, they will have access to higher education or continuing education through those partnerships, potentially at no cost. The other key partnership is working with vocational institutions where it will allow for workforce preparedness by providing opportunities for apprenticeships, coding, boot camps, construction, maintenance, project man management, robotics training, fashion, beauty, and information technology. And the trades can go on and on. Next slide. So in taking into consideration this entire 4M model, by incorporating this holistic approach through workforce, we will be able to create more economic opportunities, have healthier and happier employees, cultivate a stronger sense of support and community, improve retention, prevent burnout, create a culture of learning and team building, consistently train to upskill, foster creativity and innovation, and connect employees to a new purpose, but most importantly, get an early start in building for the next generation of leaders. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Kenya, for providing that insight. I know we have incredible questions that came through our Tolosa community. So I wanna ask um, our speakers today a few questions. I'll start off with Douglas. Um, how can we help people living in today's society, uh, in today's city from an architectural perspective? Well, it's no universal simple answer, but there are um, cities around the world that are uh, currently calming traffic, uh, uh, opening up streets to making them uh, friendly to pedestrians and um, bicycle uh, traffic and um, connecting uh, bike paths so allowing people to commute by the uh, with a bicycle instead of requiring a car and um, that's already um, proven that it's um, uh, having a positive impact on many cities throughout the world. 
So um, I think that, that really understanding that that shared space, the streetscape is the city. The edge of the city is the, is the build, are the building fronts and activating those streets is the key to making a vibrant city. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, my next question here is for Dr. Moses. How do we best prepare students for future careers, four-year university, trade school, um, and more? You know, that's 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 the big question. We are we are straining uh, to keep up with the pace of knowledge into in modern educational systems. Uh, learning is just so uh, you know, the body of knowledge is increasing exponentially. And formalized education, I think, is, 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 is falling farther and farther behind its ability to keep up. I think training uh, students for jobs, we really are training students for jobs that don't even exist. Um, uh, and so how do you do that? Well, there's some core skills, I think, that are, that are enduring and, ha and have, some, and have some, some legs going forward. First of all, um, teamwork, being able to work in a team, teaching students how to solve problems using less than complete information, teaching students how to be very good uh, uh, mediators of, of conflict, handle conflicts. Um, those are good skills. Communication skills, very, very powerful schools, skills. I think the STEM, the STEM fields, teaching, teaching students how to solve problems, using data, uh, those are gonna be enduring skills. And also uh, teaching, uh, giving students a sense of reciprocity. The idea that they're a part of a community and the community owes them and they owe the community uh, uh, and, and a sense of civic uh, responsibility, as it were. Uh, I think those are core skills. I think many of the other things that we teach are just so changeable um, that we struggle to keep up with it. So, you know, developing educational systems that are far more agile um, than the ones we have currently, I think, uh, is, 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 is really the challenge. Yeah, I was going to say that the agile approach is so, so important and experiential as well. So I'm so happy that you pointed to that. Thank you, Dr. Moses. Um, Kenya, we can't forget about you. What are some examples of schools and job training centers that have programs we can learn from? And what impact are you having also at Hofstra? Oh, you're on mute. There we go. Sorry about that. So I, I love this question because I love what Dr. Moses says. We're training young people for industries that may not even exist. So it's very important to align talents with purpose, and but also looking at the opportunities that are out there and training them for that. So some of the programs that are working are like Grid for Good that I mentioned, like National Grid. But there's also one at Hofstra, which is a Send Long Island, where we have uh, uh, a program sponsored by JP Morgan that uh, operates to support these entrepreneurs to get larger contracts from industries that they would not have access to. So that's another model. And then there's uh, the Center for Workforce Inclusion for adults 50 and over. So those are very uh, important models to look at. And the Center for Workforce Inclusion has been around for 60 years. So really looking at those that uh, have been doing the work and doing it well for a very long time. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I see a question came in. How can we help support your efforts? I love that question. I'll uh, actually kick it over to John to share how we can go about doing that. Sure. Um, and we've already I guess, generated some interest as well. Um, we are, I guess, the two areas that, uh, that you could be helpful. One, uh, we'd like to encourage you to uh, join our Tolosa Community Network. And there's an opportunity to engage and to continue this conversation. Uh, we really value your ideas and input. Uh, we thank everyone for taking time on the surveys, uh, but the uh, the community network is a more interactive way for us to have a, a conversation. And uh, we will be continuing this talk uh, into the uh, community network as well so that we can uh, continue to expand and develop the ideas. Uh, and we'll be uh, including uh, answers to any questions that we didn't get to. Same time, um, and this is important, uh, really want to go deeper uh, and to um, really develop um, ideas and uh, work on a vision, uh, identify some of the challenges and barriers and determine how we can overcome them uh, as we work towards identifying the right solutions. 
So we will be kicking off our uh, focus group. Uh, we're calling it the Tolosa Together Conversation Series. Uh, starting on April 11th and April 18th, we'll be discussing two topics. Uh, first one on housing, and we'll be uh, focusing on um, issues around affordability, accessibility, and safety. Uh, second topic is education and lifelong learning. So again, we're building on uh, today's discussion. Uh, and we would very much like to welcome uh, this group uh, to, uh, to, to join. Uh, we're looking for sort of individuals that have some knowledge, expertise, importantly, a passion and willingness to share ideas and sort of be interactive. Uh, time commitment will be two hours. Uh, these are two one hour sessions and uh, we'll be providing some materials and orientation beforehand. Uh, we have information on uh, a Eventbrite uh, sort of registration. Uh, if you see the uh, link at the bottom of the page. Uh, it's an opportunity to uh, review the details and to uh, to register. Some of you have already provided your email addresses, so we can reach out to you there as well. Uh, but uh, the ask is, uh, if you have time, we'd love to have you join uh, one of the two topics. Uh, we have the times there. And as mentioned, we'll provide information beforehand. We'll have two sessions, uh, an opportunity to meet people, learn, and again, go deeper on these important topics. Uh, and our plan is to use the, the information uh, as we speak further with our uh, real estate developers, with uh, local officials, and to really take the, the vision and to try and realize it in a specific location. Many of you have asked where Tolosa will be. Uh, we're, we are working and making some big strides. Uh, we're narrowing down the search. I, as, as shared, we're, we're down to three states and maybe down to, to one state um, some, somewhat soon. Uh, so uh, more, more to follow. But again, I'd uh, love to have you join in April. And then looking further ahead, uh, we'll be continuing our webinar series. Um, health and wellness is a topic that we'll be discussing further. Uh, the future of transportation uh, are two others that, uh, that, we're, that we're working on as well. So I'd love to have you uh, to, to join us there. So uh, again, we really appreciate your input and uh, your time as always. And um, as we talk about an inclusive city, it is really about um, conversations like this to get a diverse set of ideas uh, and to uh, to work together, uh, you know, to you know realize the, these these important goals. So again, really appreciate your time and uh, really want to hear everyone's voices and uh, we really want to work together. So. Thank you everyone for taking time to join us. Excellent. We thank you all for joining us. Um, as John said, please head over to our Telosa community, continue to engage um, and co-create with us as well. Thank you.